All right, hey guys, welcome back to the Family Songs Podcast. Uh, today we've got a pretty cool guest, uh, Mark Gordon with Short Action Customs. Mark, thank you very much for for joining us. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me. Um, so uh, Short Action Customs is honestly no stranger to Precision Rifle World. If you've been around a little bit, uh, they do some pretty cool uh, rifle work and some some tools and stuff like that that we'll get into. But one thing I do want to note before we kind of dive into everything is uh, guys, if you ever go to a match and look at the price table, there's always something from, from these guys. Um, they're, they're out supporting our matches and our sport and they're doing really cool things. And so take note when you, when you see stuff like this and support um, these companies that are out there supporting us. So um, I did really want to emphasize that because these guys are everywhere. Um, and then also, um, Mark is going to be uh, giving away something to a listener. So um, this is something I've been kind of wanting to work on. So if once this episode is live, it's going to be on Spotify, iTunes, and YouTube. Uh, all you got to do to enter to the drawing is share uh, whichever link to the to the show, tag Family Arms, tag Short Ash and Customs, and uh, tell us um, what your favorite... Um, item from them is or what you would like to have I, i'm interested to hear what you have to say and i'm going to pick the answer that i think is either the funniest or the coolest so uh put some effort into it so with all that being said mark dude thank you very much um can you kind of give us a little background of of who you are and kind of how this all came to be yeah <clears throat> so i was um i grew up on a dairy farm in ohio um didn't want to farm you know i just didn't want to be milking cows every day for the rest of my life type of deal. So when I was younger, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Uh, so I just, I figured I would join the military. Wasn't sure what branch yet, but I think I thought I wanted to do something in aviation, maybe be a pilot or something like that. So I decided to join the Marine Corps. So I joined July 9th, 2001. So before 9-11, uh, 9-11 happened when I was in boot camp. So things got pretty crazy. Um, I mean, I joined the Marine Corps because I wanted to be the Marine Corps. I didn't join it for the GI Bill or, you know, whatever. So it was pretty, you know, exciting in the sense of, you know, here I am an 18-year-old, you know, guy, kid, whatever, going to boot camp, doing all this stuff I've never done before. You know, never shot an M16 or an AR-15 even before that. So, I mean, everything was just completely new for me. But, um, you know, had a, a relatively good time in boot camp. You know, I was, you know, I really enjoyed the Marine Corps up to that point. Um Spent five years as a CH-40, I'm sorry, CH-53 helicopter mechanic, had three tours overseas. Um, you know, I had a good time and all that, and I was thinking about re-enlisting, but at the same time, I, you know, with the deployment schedules, I just thought, you know what, might be a good time to get out and start doing the stuff that I want to do. So I ended up getting out, and I was going to go to school for mechanical engineering, so I started going to our local community college, started doing that. And I kind of had like a little mini midlife crisis about, okay, what do I want to do? You know, if, if I want to be a mechanical engineer, great, I will do that. I'll stick with school. But if there's something else I want to do, like this is the time to do it. So I found a school in North Carolina it was Montgomery community college. They offered a degree program in gunsmithing. And I thought, you know what, that's a great, just bucket list item to do. You know, I don't have to do anything with it when I'm done, but you know, if I want to get a lathe and, uh, you know, just play around in my own stuff I can. So 2007, I moved down to North Carolina, joined the program and uh, really had a good time doing it. Um, you know, we started off with 16 weeks of a uh, machine shop. You know, we built action wrenches and we built, uh, you know, our own barrel vices. We built, you know, a lot of the hand tools that we would use. And besides just like a, you know, a metals class I took in high school because back you know in 2001 when I graduated we still had like wood and metals class and stuff like that I don't think they do that you know anymore but so you know in high school you know we would grind high speed steel bits and do really basic stuff well at uh, Montgomery Community College you know we made that into a 16 week semester where we were able to you know build a lot of the stuff and I just felt like I was kind of at home doing that. Like in high school, I never really applied myself. I was just kind of doing my own thing, you know, playing sports and whatever. Um, so doing medals when I was in school, I was just kind of breezing through. Well, now that I'm, you know, had my experience in the Marine Corps and I was actually going to a school that I wanted to be at, 
you know, I really tried to soak everything up. So I really kind of gravitated towards the machining side. I did really well with that. Then we got into, you know, making uh, barreled actions. You know, I did a couple of Remingtons, uh, I did a Mauser and I don't know, maybe a Howa 1500 or something like that. So throughout the whole school, everything that we did, I just really enjoyed. Um, but my heart's always been with the rifles, like growing up on the farm, you know, I would always varmint hunt. You know, I had a Remington 722 chambered in 222 Remington. That was like my first real rifle that I would go out with. And I just made so many stupid mistakes. Like you just don't know what you don't know. So, you know, for example, you know, I had to learn how to reload on my own. I was probably like 14 or 15. No one in my family really shoots or hunts. So I, I got this old kit from an uncle or something like that. But like I would zero my rifle. And I would just decide on a whim, hey, I'm going to shoot these 40 grain ballistic tips when I'm sighted in for, you know, 52, you know, spear or whatever's. And then I would miss or, you know, I'd be all over the place and I just couldn't figure out what would happen. Like I was just so ignorant to how everything worked. But that's when I kind of sparked my interest into shooting and precision and shooting groups and stuff like that. So when I got to gunsmithing school, I wanted to have a couple rifles that I could continue varmint hunting with. And uh, just kind of really I was going so I could work on my own stuff. So I completed the program in 2009. I had a great time. I loved everything we did. Uh, but my heart was more in the precision side, you know, bolt action rifles. Uh, while I was in school, I was doing bolt knob conversions and a lot of stuff like that. And this school did a great job of giving you a pretty good general foundation. But the way they taught us how to true actions was, you know, you buy the Manson or PTG reamer kit, you put bushings in the raceway and you just guide this, you know, reamer into your action and that trues your threads. Well, I ended up taking those actions that I trued with that style after I got my own lay that I coaxially dialed them in with, um, you know, an action truing rod and, and the, the bushings and all that. And, you know, all the concentricity error was still there. My action face wasn't true. My lug abutments weren't square, you know, so it did a good job of like cleaning stuff up, but it didn't fix anything. So, uh, but I wanted to be able to do the stuff on my own and just kind of play around with my own stuff. So that's why I went, well, at the end of the school, I got in touch with Gordy Gritters. Uh, you know, he's been building bench press rifles for a long time. You know, he has a lot of good stuff that he's done. So I developed a pretty good relationship with him. I was able to just kind of talk with him and bounce stuff off. And I went out to Iowa after I got done with the gunsmithing school and just spent a week or two out there with him, just, you know, learning from him, seeing how he does stuff, just being in a shop and whatnot. And that kind of just fueled more passion and more desire to keep learning because, I mean, just like with anything, you know, golf or whatever, the rabbit hole or long range shooting, the rabbit hole goes so deep. So it was good to see what other places are doing outside of, you know, like a school environment. So, uh, but I, at that point, I still wasn't planning on opening up a, a gunsmithing business or rifle shop or anything. It was just, again, bucket list items that I was going to have tucked away in my pocket. So I moved back to Ohio in 2009, uh, started working as a, a life flight helicopter mechanic for the Cleveland Clinic. Um, and it was about a hour drive one way it was up at lake erie i started in february it was just like awful nasty cold weather we had no hangar space you know it was just and my heart was never really in the aviation it was just something that okay i've got you know my airframe and power plants license like this is what i'm gonna do so while i was doing that i ended up getting a lathe you know i found one um and on our farm, we had, you know, three phase power. We had, you know, nice air compressor. We had, and we had a little room that wasn't being used. So I basically just rented about, you know, 400 square foot from the farm just to, again, do my own stuff. I wasn't really trying to do things as a full-time business. It was just, let's do some bolt knob conversions. Let's, you know, Cerakote some stuff, you know, whatever it was. I was blessed because I had these resources at my disposal where if I was living off on my own, you know, in some area that my uh, family wasn't at, you know, I'd have to acquire or rent or lease space. I'd have to, you know, get an air compressor. So to get started, I was super lucky to just have all that stuff kind of there if I if I wanted it. So I was able to rent some space and just kind of dip my toe in the water. Uh, luckily, when I was in gunsmithing school, like sniper's hide was just absolutely crazy. Um, you know, I was on all the rifle threads, the gunsmithing threads. I was just showing pictures like, hey, look, I did this bolt knob conversion. Hey, look at this Cerakote, you know, whatever. So when I started up, 
uh, doing work on the side, I already had people that reached out and said, Hey, look, you did this for me. Can you do this? So, you know, I started with the really light services and then eventually, uh, and I remember his name, I don't know if I should mention it here, but you know, this guy named Hunter, he, uh, he's like, Hey, can you chamber this rifle up? And I said, yeah, no problem. Well, it was a Badger M 2008 action I think it was a 308 Winchester. And, uh, that's the point where I'm like, all right, I got to get my FFL. I got to do all that stuff, you know, cause I, at that point I was just doing small rifle parts. Yeah. So got my FFL. I think this is in 2009 and I think May of 2010, you know, had the tax ID number, you know, we were official legit business with, with all of our paperwork and everything like that. So again, at that point I was just doing it to have weekend money and just do something I like to do. Well, it was one of those deals. I would show up at the shop on a weekend. I'd work from, you know, 8 a.m. till 2. And that was it. I just didn't have any more work to do. I was doing 1911 work. I was, you know, doing um, recoil pads and shotguns and, you know, stuff that I'm not really passionate about that I don't really get into. But it's, you know, it was money and it was a place to start. So I don't remember how it happened or when it happened, but it was just one of those deals where it's like, wow, I have to work till 10 o'clock at night. And then I have to go to my full-time job. And there was times where I'd have to pull all-nighters in the shop just to kind of keep everything on track and then go to work the next day. And it was just, I mean, that wasn't a good time doing that. But I was still on that high of just, hey, everything's so new, everything's so fun. You know, I was just grinding it out. So um, at that point, I just knew I needed to do something and I you know talked to my parents and they were very conventional like oh you've got a 401k you've got health insurance you've got a good job just stay there well my father-in-law was like screw that garbage like quit you can go back at any time so he was the one that actually convinced me to just leave my full-time job and just give it a shot because with the airframe and power plants license with the FAA it never expires so if I ever needed to go back or wanted to, my license is still good. My uh, wife, she's a nurse practitioner. I mean, she has to renew her license every couple of years. She has to have hours. She has to have continuing education where with FAA, you know, my license is always good. So that was a little nudge I needed to be like, all right, let's just give it a shot. So we did it. And, um, you know, that was like 2010. It's just been a crazy roller coaster ride up until now. And, um, the first person I hired was a customer who was local and he just said, Hey, look, if you ever need help Sarah coding or whatever, I can do that. And at first I was like, I can keep doing it, you know, cause I was doing emails, phone calls, even all the rifle work, all the bedding, all the Sarah code, all the, you know, everything shipping and receiving. And it was just getting to that point where I wasn't getting a lot of work done because shipping and, you know, how, and at that point, I don't even think we had FedEx coming to our location to do pickups. Like it was something to take stuff to the post office and take stuff to ship it out and whatnot. So it, it was one of those things I'm like, all right, I need to get some, someone else in here. So I hired him and he was a great employee and he worked really hard. He did a lot of the Cerakote. He did a lot of the stuff that, you know, embedding that um, he did a beautiful job on. And I was able to focus more on the machining side of things. So we were a great team. And uh, we've just kept, you know, growing and growing to where now we're at our third location. I've got, I think, 13 employees. And uh, our business has kind of uh, grown to where we still do, you know, our core is always the rifle work. But now we've got the manufacturing side of things as well. And that kind of transitioned in about 2018 to where we started to get into CNC. And um, because I never had any CNC experience before, 2014 and 2014 is when I decided that I wanted to get a, uh, a CNC lathe and ended up getting a Haas TL1 and this is the last year they had the, the handles and it was an open you know lathe it was basically just like a big beefy manual lathe of the CNC controller now if you were to buy that machine you know it's fully enclosed there's no handles I mean it's basically just like a small little um, you know modern CNC lathe so um, so I ended up buying that but it's like okay well what do I do with it? Like, how do I use it? So I started going to school on nights and weekends. Uh, I think I did a couple semesters to do, you know, intro to CNC machining, intro to CAD cam, you know, intro to solid work. So basically out of necessity, I needed to go to school to learn how to do 3D modeling. And I, I chose uh, SolidWorks. And then 
just to do uh, GNM uh, CNC programming. You know, like what does this code mean? How do I get it to do what I want? How do I not crash and break the thing? But the whole goal was to, you know, increase throughput, just become more efficient, have more consistency. You know, with the manual lathe, it's pretty hard to do metric threads. Uh, with the ones that we have, I've done them before. You basically can never disengage the um, the half nut for threading. So like once you start threading, you just have to stop the spindle, retract your tool, reverse the machine. You always have to leave it engaged. And you can do that, but it's just, it's a joke compared to what you can do on a CNC where it's just going, you know, 1,000 RPM and it's just, you know, so, but... I think Area 419 did a pretty funny skit where they had their um, instant machinist app thing. I mean, people think you just press a button, boom, it just creates a barrel or it does a chamber job or a part or whatever. I mean, it's going to do everything you tell it to do, good or bad. So if you tell it to do something stupid, which I've done that dozens of times, it'll execute without, you know, delay. So, um, so that's... And 14 is when we got into that. And again, we were still not even going to get into manufacturing. It's when we moved into our current location, we bought 20 acres and had a 5,000 square foot building. We actually had space. So we bought a, uh, a brand new Haas VF4 uh, Super Speed. And we only bought that mill because we were sending out so much work to uh, Carl Feld Camp at Camp Feld Customs for fluting, uh, bolt fluting. I mean, we were just doing so much stuff that we had to outsource that the, the time frames were, were hard on our customers as additional cost. We weren't making any money on the fluting because, you know, with all the shipping and everything. So we just did some math and calculated out that we would actually be ahead if we brought that in house. So in 2018, we bought that mill just to have something to do side bolt releases, eight by 40 screw upgrades, uh, M16 extractor installs, the fluting, just a lot of the rifle services that I was just tired of doing on a manual machine. We wanted to automate it and just make it easier. So that was when we got our first real machine. And that just kind of after that, we're like, hey, you know what? We actually have the capability to do stuff. And uh, at that point, we were still using the uh, the steel barrel vices that I made when I was in gunsmithing school. And they're built like a tank. I mean, it's two monster pieces of, uh, I don't know, two inch by two inch steel that we machined an inch and a half bore in. But there was four uh, three eighths by 24 cap head screws on the top. And it just took forever to take this thing on and off. And then I would catch, you know, myself or other employees, like trying to take a Cerakoted barrel and slide it in or slide it out. And then you bump something. So it's like, you know what? I just wish we had some type of barrel vice. I would just kind of pivot open and close, you know, had some type of um, system to where you could just set the barrel on and boom, it's, and it's really quick. And that's kind of what led us to design the uh, the modular barrel vice. And that was the first time we were like, hey, maybe we should try making products because at that point, you know, I had someone helping run the TL1. So we were doing action trimming and, and all the barrel work. And I was kind of available to where I was, you know, I was, I was working with people. I would bed rifles. I would do this. And I was kind of doing the things I wanted to do, you know, all the inspections, rifles, but I had capacity. So I'm like, let's see if we can make something on this machine. So that's in 2018 is when we kind of did a little pivot and decided to try making something with it. So. Damn, that's, that's awesome. Uh, so there's a lot of information. So it, your story, especially kind of like starting out, it, it reminds me a lot of like how I got into stuff. And it's some, especially like thinking back on some of the stupid, more, uh, I just wasn't educated type things that I would try to do. And, uh, but it's fun. You, you, <laughs> you learn from it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you don't get hurt it can be uh pretty valuable yeah like i remember uh the, the first time i ever tried shooting shooting long range my so my very first rifle was like remington 700 308 the sps little short 308 and i had a this was back when nikon made scopes little nikon like three to nine with a bdc and my buddy had a target at like 950 yards and i could zoom all the way out to like a three and you could see the little stem and I was just trying to, it, yeah. And it was, yeah. it was dumb. We hit it somehow, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah that's, uh huh. 
when I would hunt woodchucks and stuff, it would it was with like a three by nine or four to twelve just duplex reticle. Yeah. So everything is just holding over. There was no lines. There was no. It was just like, well, I think I should be doing this. And really, wind wasn't much on my radar. Like if it was windy, I would just wait till woodchucks would just kind of. You know, from their standing up, they would just kind of lay down, and I would, yeah. you know, if the wind's blowing this way, I would shoot at their head or whatever. So, it's um, it's just crazy what you can get away with. But I mean, just like with twenty twos and BB guns, you know, you can get pretty good with that stuff if that's what you're training with and that's what you use a lot. Yeah. So, uh, okay, so you so you started out doing all, all, all the, you know, the smaller stuff, and then getting into the, the rifles, um. Uh, so, okay, I got one of the so I, y'all started doing like the gun of the week type deal for y'all social media, uh, and y'all, I, I swear y'all put out some of the coolest looking like rifles, rifle packages, and uh, in this the Cerakote stuff that y'all do is just yeah. insane. Yeah. Uh, how, like how. Like, how do you go from from like I'm gonna you know make this green to you know full custom? Yeah, the oh, only thing that I can take credit for is I hired people that are way better than me and stuff. Because <laughs> I'm extremely square when it comes to you know the creative artistic side. You know, I like my flat dark earths, my blacks, my OD greens, whatever. Like that's me. Yeah, uh, I've got two guys, Josh and Jaron, that are just they'll try anything they spend a lot of time just playing and tweaking with stuff so i mean they're the creative mind behind all that stuff you know we'll work with customers and they'll give us ideas or they might even spoon feed us what they want but my brain just doesn't work in that way to where i could execute that and, and josh and jaron have done an awesome job of just bringing these things to life and uh yeah they're they're way more talented and artistic than i am when it comes to that so i'm super lucky i was able to find people that they're passionate about it but they're able to do that as well so okay yeah, yeah hats cool. off to them because the the stuff that they come up with and are able to i mean i couldn't draw yeah. that with pencils much less yeah to a rifle sometimes customers will tell us hey look this is what we want but we'll leave it up to you i'm sure i'll like it and we do the thing that we think they want and they're like yeah i don't like that at all it's like <laughs> didn't really give us any guidance you said <laughs> do what we would do and but you know we always try to take care of them so you know we just sandblast it off and redo it or whatever but yeah it's we're willing to do that because you know it, it's different and unique and like i said literally every gun i have is flat dark earth black or whatever it, you know cryptic camo or whatever uh but they are willing to just try and do anything so we've got a, a vinyl cutter that we can do all of our stencils with up and uh, we print and do all that stuff so that's awesome. Um, okay, and, and on a little bit of a side note, cause I know I know you just talking about building rifles. You do y'all do a lot with the six by forty seven, correct? Yeah. Why yeah, why the six forty seven? Um, I think it's just the perfect little cartridge for a couple reasons. One is it typically feeds extremely well. Uh, Lapua brass. I've always been just a big fan of like the 6547 Lapua Brass. It just works. It's great. It's tough. Um, ballistically, I think, you know, the, the six Creed more has more horsepower on the top end, mm -hmm. but you know, with, um, 39.8 grains of 4350 with a 105 burger, you know, you're 2930, you know, I've had barrels where, you know, 40 grains of 4350 is almost uh 3000 feet per second. But, um, it's with the six creed more you're just burning more powder to get just a little bit better so i think it's a more efficient cartridge than that the 30 degree shoulder just it feeds good it's not you know this big massive straight you know bodied setup um you know i like the dashers and stuff like that but i've had so many 647s just every single one shoots and the people on our shooting team have had similar um experiences but um I've also met people that they wouldn't wipe their butt with a 647. You know, they yeah. just, they couldn't get it to shoot or it was finicky or whatever. And I think that kind of goes back to like the bullet jump and, um, you know, the way people work up loads. And we've got employees here that have their own process and they do their own thing. They're extremely meticulous, but 
it's I feel like when you're in a jump window for your bullet and then you're in a charge weight window for your uh, charge weight, you know, it's, it can be extremely forgiving. And the 647 is one of those cartridges we started doing our bullet jump testing with first. And that's actually the one that kind of put the jump uh, on our radar was I bought a, a pressure trace system. I've had one for a couple of years, you know, probably six years now, and we've been playing with it. And what I was doing is I actually built myself a six Creed more and I was shooting, I was like the 110 Sierra Match Kings when that bullet first came out and BC was super hot. And I just happened to have this window where that six Creed more was just an absolute hammer. I mean, it all fell apart after, you know, because that bullet was very finicky with a uh, jump, but I was like, my 647s for the birds. I mean, this six Creed more runs circles around it. So I was just literally burning my barrel up playing around just with that pressure trace system. And I was just seeing how it wasn't even a bullet jump test. It was more a case capacity and case fill test where I wanted to see how that would change the pressure curve. So I was basically shooting five shot groups and I started with, I don't know, maybe 5,000 in the lands and then five off and then 10 off. And I just kept going. And I thought the pressure trace system was broken or it wasn't working right because for five shots, like the traces weren't really that consistent. They were kind of scattered. Some would spike right away. And then other ones had like a little delay or a step and then the pressure would spike. And I'm like, man, this, this thing isn't consistent. So, but I kept shooting. And when I got to like, I don't know, 80,000 or 85,000 jump with the 105s, like every single trace was just like stacked on each other. And it did that for like the next group as well. I'm like, wow, that's kind of crazy. Like, is this thing broken or whatever? So I did the test again and it did that as well. I'm like, wow, that's crazy that for whatever reason, the chamber pressure was extremely consistent with that much jump. So that's why we're like, all right, well, maybe we need to start looking into it because up until that point, you know, you, you throw every charge to the kernel and you do all this stuff to get your um, charge weight right. But when it comes to jump, you just, all right, I'm going to try you know, 15, 25, 35, 45, and then you're done. Whatever one shoots the best, you just kind of go with it because it didn't seem to be a very scientific way from what I was doing to establish a good bullet jump. And, you know, you can talk with F-class shooters and they think, and I'm not speaking for them, but I've heard people say, you know, in 3,000 increments, you know, you make your adjustments and you can see patterns repeat and whatever, like, I need to hit the easy button sometimes. A lot of times I'm shooting a match. I'm literally loading the ammo at 2 a.m. Before that, we got to leave at five, whatever. And I just need the stuff loaded. So we would just kind of like choose a jump that would work. And there are times where I've had rifles that were just finicky. You know, you drive to Texas or you know, drive to another state and um, you're having a hard time zeroing. Nothing's really working out that well. But when you left, I mean, everything was hammering. You had a relatively clean barrel. So um, we just knew that there was something kind of going on and we needed to kind of look at the bullet jump a little bit more. Okay. So I, I did, yeah, I did some looking into uh, some of the bullet jump stuff that you put out. Uh, so did, were you finding that, was it was it just about everything that was wanting to jump that far no uh or it's further than what people think i guess yeah like one example is like the 175 and 168 sarah match king like those bullets legitimately like that 20 thou jump area it just works so well there um the hornady 108 eldm that you know the six of bullet that thing likes 35 thousandths or so um, I wish I had time and money to just sit there and create this massive library of, of jump stuff, but all the testing and all the shooting we did was just our own components, our own stuff that we're literally buying from Midway or on the mark or whoever at basically uh, retail prices. So we wanted to get the big ticket items first, but we also wanted to do, you know, it made sense to start with like the six, five Creed more. It's, yeah. you know, three to one, the most popular cartridge that we were chambering. I'd have to check our uh, numbers now, but it's just extremely popular. And then the factory ammo. So we wanted to start with the 140s and 147 ELDMs. 
and just start with that. So at our new shop, we've got, since we have 20 acres, we built a second level shooting room that's right next to our reloading room. So we can open up these big double windows, you know, pull them right out and just shoot right out of our building. The problem is, you know, when it's 15 degrees outside and it's 70 degrees in there, you get this massive mirage. So we'd have to, you know, close the the main door, but open up that room, let it let it get down to temperature and whatnot. And we would do our tests. We, we bought a uh, Silver Mountain target system. We have that set up at 600 yards. Uh, I feel like 600 yards is a great distance to where you're giving everything enough distance and time to settle down and do whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's still long enough range where if we did jump testing at 300 yards, I just, or any type of testing, yeah, that's, it's not a hundred, but it's still not that far. But if you can shoot and do a ladder test, we're shooting 20 consecutive shots and you have like five to seven shots in a row, you know, consecutive shots that are within an inch of vertical at 600 yards. I mean, that is screaming at you. It's trying to tell you something where if you shoot at a hundred yards or even closer, it's you, I don't know. I, I don't think the data is as valid. So we got the target system, we've got the range, we've got the room. So it's like, all right, let's do some real testing because if we had to drive 30 minutes of some other range, set up something, you know, people are shooting our targets, you have to go cold all the time. We just wouldn't be able to do it. But since we've got this on our own property, we're able to, to uh, do a tremendous amount of shooting and testing right away. So we started with the uh, 65 Creedmoor 140. And the test was I had two different rifles. One was their both defiance actions. One was their uh, elite, which was their uh, uh, control round feed style uh, action with their updated firing pin geometry. The other one was basically just like a deviant or a ruckus. And we had two 26 inch barrels. One was a heavy palma. The other one was a Remington varmint. And we just shot five five shot groups at different jump uh, ranges. And that was such an awful horrible test to do because i hate shooting groups anyway i hate sh and we did it i think 400 yards it was just an awful test and it's like this is not a realistic way to test jump but what we noticed was both rifles really like that 50 to 70 000, uh jump range on that test so we're like all right how can we come up with a better streamlined test to get to those results quicker without shooting groups because you know you shoot five five shot groups then you shoot a couple more to verify that's just a lot of rounds down range so we use the ladder uh method style that we everybody uses with uh charge weights and we said okay well let's just do that the bullet jump going from zero to ninety five thousands jump i mean you could go to two hundred thousands if you want to but how many shots fired before things heat up too much, your barrel gets too hot, you get too much mirage coming off your rifle, you just lose interest. I mean, as a human, to shoot 40 consecutive shots, I mean, you know, so we thought 20 shots was good. So if we did 5,000 increments, that'd be a good. Uh, so we did that and we got the, pretty much the same exact results. But what it also showed us is when things are going in and out of a node, where when you just shoot groups, it's a yes or a no. It shoots good or it doesn't. But when you can see things consistently tighten up, they peak and then they walk back out of it, I think that's kind of valuable there too. So that's what that ladder test kind of allows you to do, whether it's charge weight, uh, jump. And uh, talking with Greg Dykestra from Primal Rights, I mean, he's, he recommends doing that with primer seating depth with their uh, primer seater. You know, you do a primer seating depth ladder test. Now, I haven't had time to do that. But, uh, you know, I'm sure you could do that. So uh, so we started with that. And then we uh, we tried with a couple more rifles. We had very consistent results. So then I contacted a friend of mine who I'm also going to recommend for the podcast, but Aaron Hip. Um, he His job was to try to break our test. He's like, okay, you're getting some good results, but let me build up a test and I'm going to see if I can break it. So we designed this test where we had one rifle, you know, 65 Creedmoor, one bullet, which is the 147 ELDM, but we had three different shooters, three different charge weights, and three different um, ways that the, the test was shot. And we were going to see it because people would say, oh, well, of course, you know, you're thinking the bullet jump, you know, the, the longer jump shoots better. That's because your barrel is becoming more thermally stable. And, you know, I've had everybody throw everything at me about why things are happening. 
and I don't get too worked up over it because I don't really care why it's doing it. I just want to be able to identify it. So we shot the test. So we had, you know, Aaron hip shot one test that was, I think, in complete random order. We had a random number generator and we shot the test. So it could have been, you know, 50 thou jump, but then 70 and then 15 and then 95, you know, it was shot like that all on the target system. We record all the velocities and everything. And then Matt Steiner from uh, MKM, he he was there also. So he shot the next test and he shot it in conventional order, but he shot like 41.3 grains of powder. You know, so he shot a different charge weight. Then I shot the last test in reverse order. So 95 thousandths jump all the way down to zero. And I shot it with like a heavier uh, charge weight of like 43, uh, I think it was 42.3 or something like that. Um, so we had three charge weights, three shooters and three orders of the test. And when we stacked all the results in Excel side by side, they were literally identical. It was basically that 50 to 70 thousandths range was there on all three. So it didn't matter what the charge weight was, what the, you know, the order that the test was shot or who shot it. We had extremely consistent results. Uh, and I just kind of was like, wow, maybe there is, you know, this is a good way of doing it. And then we just started building our library where we started shooting six mils. We noticed with a 105 burger hybrid, like 80 to 85 thousands jump somewhere in that is just absolutely golden. And I'm, I was shooting, you know, 20 thousands jump, 25, whatever the 647 for years. And it would shoot extremely well, but the window was this big that it would operate in, you know, it just, it didn't. And if you change your internal pressures or, you know, whatever, it would just get out of there. But, and that's, what's really tricky in my opinion is people go for these short jumps because when things are right, they do shoot extremely small groups. I mean, that's when you're going to shoot your one whole groups, but the window is so small where I want to be able to have, you know, a 10 thousands jump window and a half a grain charge weight window where I'm still getting the same vertical at distance. That's all I care about personally. So, um, so we started shooting all these other bullets to kind of see if it was repeatable. And it was, um, you know, we shot the 140 LDM a lot, the 108 ELDM, the 147, the 105 hybrid, the 115 DTAC from um, uh, Superior Shooting Systems. I mean, that's a great bullet. Uh, you know, it's been through so many revisions over the years. I don't even know where they're at anymore. But a couple of years ago, I mean, that bullet just loved, you know, 80 thousands jump. And I had um, another company that loads custom ammo for like, a, that's your full-time job. They contacted me and said, hey, look, we got this 243 that you built. Can't get it to shoot. I'm like, okay, you know, what's going on? Give me the details. He said, I'm shooting the 115 D-Tech. And I'm like, all right, good. And I'm familiar with that bullet. And he's like, I'm shooting this or that. And he's like, I just can't get it. I'm like, well, where are you jumping? And he's like, man, I've tried everything. I've tried, you know, 20, 25, 30, 35, you know, thou jump. It just won't shoot. And I said, just humor me for a minute. Just go right to... 80 or 85,000 jump and let me know. And he emailed me back that day and said, holy crap, I can't shoot a group bigger than, you know, quarter of a way. Like that was the ticket. So it's, there's so much conventional wisdom or just things that we've been doing when there's, there's a lot of room for improvement. And I think the bullet jump, um, you know, I wholeheartedly believe that that's how we should be checking it. Now, I haven't done it with solids. I haven't done it with subsonic. I've been meaning to do that with like a 300 blackout subsonic to see if that's going to help because, you know, with that type of bullet, if you're shooting a, a 220 match king at you know, 300 yards, your vertical might be a mile high. Yeah. So maybe being in a jump node could tighten that up, but I just, I just haven't had time to, yeah, to try okay. that type of stuff, but we started getting extremely consistent results and um, I'll pause for a second so you can catch up. I could just keep going. No, no, you're you're good. I'm 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 listening. Uh, it, it's it's good info. There's so much there's so much BS out on the internet. People that think they know. So just yeah, keep keep rolling. This is this is awesome. Yeah. Um. So I mean, we just started shooting all those other bullets, and uh, we saw it across the board. So we were for a short time doing like load work up for customers when I had time, and what we would do is we'd start with because we're so blessed that we have the property, the range already set up, you know, cause we built it, the target system, all that right here at our shop. I couldn't imagine like buying a rifle, having to drive an hour to a local range, you know, pay a membership, doing load work up there. It would just be an absolute nightmare. I feel like. So 
we had a couple customers that basically painted that story said, will you please just work up a load, you know, whatever. So we decided to do it and we would start with the bullet jump. Let's say it was a six, five PRC with a one forty seven or one forty three ELDX, because that bullet is just about identical to the one forty seven. I think it just has a little bit thicker jacket. So that's why it's a hair lighter, but, um, we would do the bullet jump ladder test and we would share all the results. So it's not like we would just say, abracadabra, here's your load. We would do two consecutive bullet jump tests at two different charge weights, just for redundancy sake. We would share that with them. Hey, look, we're going to go with, you know, 55,000 jump because both, you know, that's in the middle of both tests. Then we would do the charge weight ladder test where we would focus on getting uh, and I believe in the theory of optimal barrel time. I think that there is, you know, harmonics going through a barrel and all that. And you want your bull to leave at a harmonically balanced time. And I think doing the charge weight ladder test is how you time that up. So we would then do a charge weight ladder test. And what we would notice is because the bullet jump was done first, I mean, that's what's flying through the air. That's what's hitting your target. So if you give the bullet what it wants first, your charge weight ladder test results are more robust. And I think they're they're truer because if you do your charge weight ladder test first, and let's say you're not even in a bullet jump mode, you're kind of getting skewed and not really accurate results. So we would do the jump first, then we do the charge weight ladder test. And then every single time we would do load workup, we would provide two five shot groups at 600 yards that would have to do better than half MOA. And every time we were able to hit that no problem, because we're in the jump node, we're in the charge weight node. And, you know, we're, we've got, you know, an amp annealer, we've got good equipment to where we are building quality brass or uh, ammo. But the most important thing is getting that jump node and then your charge weight node, because getting the jump node is getting your bullet what it wants, getting your charge weight is giving your rifle what it wants, and then getting your uh, extreme spreads lower is just getting, you know, the external ballistics tune because i'm not going to deny that having a small es and sd is important i mean it is i mean but i think it's the last of the three that you need to focus on so you know when people show their instagram you know social media pictures of their magneto speed or lab radar or a garmin about their extreme spread i mean i could go shoot in a berm not even hit a target and you know get low numbers that's that's only a third of the story in my opinion so but yeah, we did a lot of shooting in a couple of years. I mean, thousands of rounds. Our neighbors probably hated us. Actually, I know one of them does, but uh, <laughs> yeah, but it was worth it. That's awesome. That's I mean, that's good info. I, I've I've been I, I've been kind of following it for a while, and it's it, I, I think it's interesting. So yeah. um, I do kind of want to get into like the the tools and stuff that y'all started making. Um, so I I've got. Well, I've got a lot of y'all stuff here at the shop. And the, so the, did it start with the barrel bias? Is that yep. what you said? Yeah, it okay. started with the barrel bias. Um, and I'm trying to think of what came next, probably the final scope level. And um, I've actually got the first prototypes that I uh, ever made. I keep uh, in my office all the, the prototypes. And this was the first one here that I made. And my thought was... I have this ball in the center that will allow the top to kind of gimbal and move. And then you would, you know, these are like little throw levers, but it was looking back was the dumbest idea because when you try to tighten this down, it moves <laughs> and it's like, okay, well, how am I supposed to do anything if this thing moves all the time? So it was actually uh, Josh from my employees said, you know what I would do if I were you is I'd use rod ends in the center and then use them to kind of like allow it to fine tune. So, but the reason why we started making the scope levels because people were paying us to mount their optics. And there's just, again, just like with everything else, oh, you put the bubble level on the top of your turret, you put a uh, feeler gauge set underneath the bottom of your scope, you whatever, blah, blah, blah. But I don't think anybody can argue if you have your scope rail perfectly level or as level as you possibly can, you have a plumb hanging up that's perfectly straight up and down. You can't argue that mounting your scope to where your reticle or at least the mechanism inside brings your you know center aiming point straight up and down that that would be the best case scenario. So that's what we were doing because we've got a hundred yard range set up as well. We've got a plumb but the problem was the products we were using 
you couldn't bolt down. You couldn't properly secure them. It was just, there was three little jack screws or something with a bullseye level. And you just go to put your scope on it and now you've moved it. And then you don't, you know, so we just felt bad about charging people. And it was only like 45 bucks or whatever, but to, to install a scope when we just didn't have that warm and fuzzy that we knew for a fact, it was completely level. So that's when we decided to design the, the final scope level. We added the, um, the four rod ends, which this is another one of the early prototypes right here to where you just adjust these thumb wheels and it'll, you know, move the top rail um, and get everything leveled up to where it's super, super stable and it's solid and you can, you know, crank your turrets and do stuff and it's not going to move it. So then we bought some horse cats targets, set those up at a hundred yards, which my uh, kids have brought in the shop one day and they were outside. It was a nice day. And I saw them, they took a big stick and they were just beating these horse cats targets, which were like, 80 bucks for a couple targets or whatever. And they're like, just obliterated them. But, um, <laughs> so we don't have those anymore, but, uh, we would do, you know, like little, um, dial tests where we would get zeroed up and we had the, the final scope level mounted on a, uh, an I beam bolted to concrete and we would dial up and down and left and right and whatever. And we would actually notice some of the scopes and the reticle was perfectly straight up and down. And these are even some of the $3,000 plus high end scopes you might be two tenths off on your windage when you're at 10 mils of elevation, even though your reticle tracked perfectly straight up and down, it stayed parallel, but it would step over just a little bit. So that is not a big deal because you can adjust for that in your, your software. But if you don't even know it's doing that, you're always going to be chasing demons and stuff. So we found it to be, and you don't even need the cat's target to do it. You would just run right up and down your plumb and you can see if it steps over left or right or whatever so we're able to kind of learn more by having a tool that was solid enough so it's been a great product for us and there's actually a lot of oems that use it uh, for setting up optics or testing or whatever as well so that's awesome yeah i i got it i don't know maybe eight or nine months ago and i was just i've been moving scopes around on somebody to and it's awesome. It's it, it's crazy how fast it just makes everything, and yeah. it's right. And our uh, philosophy is, you know, we're not gonna. We typically don't build anything that somebody else is already doing very similar. Every single one of our products, it doesn't have to be unique or different just for the sake of it. But I'm not gonna waste any time making a scope ring if there's plenty of companies that build a really, really nice scope ring. You know, we're just not going to do it to keep spindles turning or whatever. So everything that we build, I feel like is, has departed enough from what's out there in a good way to where it's worth our time to to do it. So. Yeah. So, so I, I want to talk about the dies. So cause I think that those really stand, stand I use for loan ammo for customers all the time. And, and when I, I switched all of them over to these and, you know, I think especially when they came out, they're very different than what the, the standard die on the market was. So I, I'm kind of just like how you came up with the system that they are now. And, and then I guess in your words, like what, what makes them as good as they are? You know, we were never going to make dies because all we had was a mill and that's, we could do all the things we wanted on a mill. Um, but I was starting to shoot the six BRA. I ordered some custom dies, you know, they were a couple hundred bucks or whatever. And I got it and they were rusted on the inside or whatever. So I sent them back and, you know, they probably put in a three jaw, squirt some WD-40 with some sandpaper, polish them up and sent them back. But I was sizing my brass and the base was hardly sizing at all, but the shoulder, you know, shoulder on our BRA reamer is, uh, it's basically 471, I'm sorry, 461, it's a 4609. Well, it was sizing the shoulder like five or six thousandths. And I'm like, why is it doing that? Like, it doesn't need to be doing that. And then it wasn't even touching the base. So, and we've been using, you know, Redding dies for years. And we've had, you know, pretty good luck with them overall. The biggest issue I had with some of the out of the box uh, dies were I was always having to machine some off the bottom to get 
to bump the headspace back. And then they were typically sizing a little bit too much on the shoulder and not really a whole lot on the inside. So I thought, all right, if we're going to build a die, what would I do differently? So first off, you know, 12L14 is, is a uh, material that a lot of people use. And 12L14 is literally like the aluminum of steels. It's just, you can't do anything wrong. It cuts like butter. You get, you know, years of tool life but it's just not the best material for making the die. And even 416, I feel like is a little bit better as far as it's a little bit tougher, but it's still not that tough. So we, uh, we looked into 17.4 stainless and it's a pain in the butt. I mean, it's super hard on tools. It doesn't break a chip very easy, uh, but it just machines extremely nice and it leaves a great finish uh, and it's a, a lot tougher material. So we decided to choose that material to go with. But as far as the design goes, when we were using the new lawn die blanks, you know, they've got this threaded decapping pin that's like this long. And you know, there's like three inches or two inches of thread on there. And I did not want to have to do that. You know, I think they're roll threading theirs or whatever. But, you know, I think they were explaining to me one time that after they thread them, they have to then put them on B blocks and straighten them back out because the threading process will bow them. And I'm just thinking, what a nightmare. Like that totally sucks. So I just thought, how can we eliminate the need to have to thread a decapping pin? And that's kind of where we came up with our solid decapping pin that was um, a little bit smaller than the bullet diameter. And then we needed to find a way to hold it and all that stuff. So we designed the ER11 collet system and whatnot. And um, the first mistake we made is during our testing, when you tighten up that uh, knurled top cap, like we were just hand tightening it and it was fine. But when other people started doing it, um, it was pushing the decapping pin. It wasn't enough. So we had to add the little wrench flats and that needed to get tightened down. But um, it's, we just mainly focused on trying to get the right geometry in the chamber, you know, so where the brass was sizing enough on the base, enough on the shoulder and that was pretty much our precision resizing die, which is more of a conventional die in the sense that the body and the shoulder were machined into the die. The problem in our, our die is we were pretty much single point ID turning them. So we're using a boring bar to cut them. Uh, we were able to get extremely good finish. We were able to kind of get up in the tight spots with it, but it's just a super long, difficult process to do that because we're constantly playing with tool offsets we're constantly changing our boring bars. It's just not an easy way of doing it. So with the precision sizing die, which is the first die that we made, you know, since it had the shoulder in it, we'd have to have this boring bar would have to climb up the shoulder and then start to go through the neck area because that's where the neck bushing would sit. And that was just a real pain in the butt to machine that detail. So we started thinking about um what's next but before i go there I'll, I'll mention that we um during all the testing i knew that because i was turning the outside of the die turning the inside of the die and measuring it in the machine that everything was completely concentric and round but then when we were sizing brass we were still getting neck run out issues and it's like what is going on so i'm like you know what i'm gonna just try making my own neck shoulder bushing i'm not even gonna heat treat it i'm just gonna take it right off the lathe and boom and immediately it started helping our uh, neck runout issues. So that's when we designed our neck sizing bushing to where we added a little, it's like, I don't know, like a three degree taper or funnel on the bottom of the, um, the bushing to where the brass just flows in it. Because with like a standard neck bushing that we were using for you know years and years and years, and we've probably got a hundred of them, um, it's just a straight diameter. There's a tiny little edge break and then it's a straight diameter. So when you've got your brass neck, which is, you know, let's say you're shooting a six mil and it's blown out to 472, but you've got a 468 uh, bushing, you're just taking a straight diameter brass neck and just jamming it into this small diameter uh, bushing with no lead in. There's no funneling. It's just, it jolts it. And I think that's where you get a lot of your neck run out. So we created just that little taper on the bottom to where that taper will actually allow the neck, you could set the bushing on top of the neck and it'll sit there. So the inside or the outside diameter of your neck is completely supported and actually starts in the neck bushing before it'll size. So we started doing that and we were immediately getting extremely good concentricity numbers. And um, 
like Speedy Gonzalez, we do a lot of custom uh, neck sizing bushings for him. And there's a lot of people that exclusively use our neck sizing bushings in more conventional dyes that have the, the body and the shoulder in it because it'll give you the best run out because it's you're just not forcing this oversized cylinder in a smaller hole. You know, it's got a nice uh, taper and it funnels it right in there. And um, that kind of led us to design the neck shoulder bushing of our current modular sizing die. That die body is actually a lot easier to make because when we make it, we just take, a, you know, if we're doing, let's say, a 6.5 Creedmoor die, we'll take, a, um, I don't know, 400 and like a 7 16 diameter drill and we'll blow it through the whole length of the body and open that hole up. Well, then we can use bigger, heavier, more rigid boring bars to cut the inside because all we're doing is just the cartridge body. So on a Creedmoor, you know, we're going from, you know, the 4714 to 463, you know, minus our sizing numbers, you know, so we're able to do that a lot easier. And then having the neck shoulder bushing where the shoulder uh, body radius, the shoulder, the neck shoulder radius, and the neck are machined into one bushing. The brass just perfectly flows in there because it's this seamless transition right into your uh, the neck area. So, you know, we get super good concentricity numbers on that die as well. So, you know, we got the 17 forward machines extremely well. We're doing a super nice uh, nitride process that increases lubricity. It's super hard. It's super slick. We've got, you know, the, the right body geometry, which we are sizing more at the base than other dies. And you can actually feel it sometimes. It might not feel as easy as, you know, another die, but that's because the base is the thickest, toughest part to size. And that's the, the part that needs to be kept in check more. So it's a little bit more pressure to size it, but it's properly sizing your brass. And then we're, we're barely sizing the shoulder. We're basically sizing the shoulder only enough to where people know that it's getting sized, but it, we're not trying to go any more than we absolutely have to. So we're not really disturbing the top of the uh, brass a whole lot because, you know, it's a perfect seamless transition into the neck shoulder bushing and we're not constricting the uh, the shoulder down too much. We just get super good concentricity numbers and we'll, we'll do tests where we'll take a fired annealed 6.5 Creedmoor piece of brass and we will basically have a, a 22 Creedmoor die set up. So that's the Creedmoor body with just a I don't know, 250 or 249 neck shoulder bushing. And in one shot, we'll take a 6.5 Creedmoor down to a 22 Creedmoor. And you'll have a thou or less of neck run up. Where in the past, like when I was making 647 brass, you know, you got to get your 6547 yeah. die. And then you put in your... Um, your 283 bushing, and then you do your 275, and then you do your two, you know, whatever. You got to do it in steps and you still have crazy run out. So we're able to do that in one shot with way better run out. And it's just one pull of the, the press. So, um, yeah. It, yeah. I, uh, <laughs> I was messing around. I, I, I actually did the, that same, I threw a, mm -hmm. I have a 22 GT bushing in and, the die that I forgot I was messing around with and pulled it out and I was like that got a lot small <laughs> a lot small but it, it made me yes yeah, so I started pulling it and I started measuring everything and it it was insane it yeah yeah I think it was like a half hour run out and did it in one step and it was they're yeah. badass y'all did y'all did a really good job with it thank you thank you yeah and then with our bullet seating die, it was kind of like the same thing where, you know, if we're making all these dies, it's like, okay, do we have a six BR die, a six BRX bullet seating die, a six dasher, you know, a six alpha dasher, a six forty seven, a six G, you know, all of them are seating this similar bullets. They all have the same base diameter. So just out of not laziness, but just a desire to not have a million SKUs to do the same thing, it's like. Why don't we make just a straight cylindrical bore that's extremely, um, you know, it's it's concentric to the inside and outside, and it's very consistent. Why don't we just have that interface with the base diameter, and then everything just slides up and down the center line of that? And that's kind of just how we decided to do our uh, bullet seating die because, you know, I've got I don't know probably forty or fifty Redding and Forrester and RCBS and 
you know, some other dies upstairs that we, you know, acquired over the years. And it's every single one has a bullet seating die, you know, where, you know, some people want that because they want to have it set up and they don't want to mess with it. And other people, you know, I guess I'm kind of a cheapskate by nature. Like I don't need to buy four different bullets, you know, seating dies. I really just set it up and just use the same one type of deal. So that's kind of like how we decided to design, you know, the, the bullet seating die that we have. Yeah, honestly, that's one of my favorite things. I started, I start when y'all had just the one. Uh, I got that, and I, I love that y'all are doing more and more of them. But yeah, it's that same same thing. And I got, I got so sick of having to buy. It. And then honestly, I was like, do you even buying, you know, whatever they are, three hundred seventy five dollar dies. Like I'm saving a shitload of money buying these than having to buy a hundred different cartridges and or seating right. dies for different stuff and yeah and or, we also have the ability of you know tweaking or modifying anything that we want for example like our bullet seating stems you know we make right around four different versions mm -hmm. just because you know we've got a, a kions optical measuring system and all that and we've tried to measure bullets and ogives and what the radii are and all that stuff, it's dang near impossible. So we make a bunch of different versions. So, you know, our customers can just try and see which one works best for them. But, you know, if we, if Berger or Tub or somebody reached out and said, Hey, look, use this geometry. I mean, we could do it. It's, it could be done that day type of deal. So, you know, because we don't just have this long little skinny bullet seating stem and we can make them and we can do whatever we want. It's just, I don't know what the right, you know, thing is we've done a lot of tests and we've tried a lot of different geometry from just, you know, just angles to tangent radii and all kinds of stuff to see what works the best. And what we found is the thing that works the best is the stickiest, you know, when it comes to, you know, wanting to grab the bullet and it's because it's engaging and it's holding the bullet and it's contacting the bullet. That's what keeps everything straight and concentric, but it'll kind of pop a little bit when you go to pull it out and um you know so i'm the type of guy i'd be like okay whoop you do it pops but that's not maybe necessarily the right you know business answer because i don't want my customers being disappointed with how something works but at the same time it's like you know in life everything's a compromise you know it's it's popping or catching or maybe there's a little more tension and that's the problem with our arbor press seating die is because you have to manually pull that loaded cartridge out Sometimes it can be a little bit sticky with a bullet seating stem because it's contacting it lower on the ogive and it's, you know, it, it's just got more solid contact with it where a lot of the bullet stems that we've used in the past from competitors dies. I mean, it's right there up at the bullet nose. I mean, there's, I can't tell you how many bullet noses I've deformed from just because that's where they touch them. And when you're that far away from the, the base, when you're pushing down, you are going to induce run out and other issues with it. So, um, but I mean, we're always playing with stuff and we're always willing to, um, to try things. It's just on a whim, you know, we're not going to down a machine, retool it up unless we've got real reasons or if someone can convince us, you know, otherwise that there's something that needs to change or update. Like I said, if one of the manufacturers were to reach out and share some geometry, like in a heartbeat, we wouldn't, make a specific stem for that specific bullet but no one's going to share that you know no one's going to say okay here's the way our bullet geometry is you know <laughs> so. yeah okay and so uh y'all y'all launched the the new press this year and i got to i, I, I mess with a little bit at shot show uh yeah. <clears throat> can i tell it's i i mean kind of like a lot of the stuff y'all do it's it's different than everything else I've seen and it's, I think it's pretty neat. Can you kind of walk us through how, yeah. how that design came, came about? Right. So we were never going to do a reloading press. I mean, it was just the only time we do stuff is again, when I feel like, okay, there's actually room for things to happen. So, you know, we've used pretty much everybody's reloading press over the years. We've had great results. I mean, you know, I've had, a Reading T7 turret press I've loaded for years. And yeah, the, the turret flexes and it's it's kind of sloppy. But again, I'm the type of guy that if I'm in a charge weight 
and jump node, I'll throw powder on a little bench top, you know, volume thrower. Like, so I don't get too crazy worked up, but the issues that I was having is actually is a couple things. One is with our dyes, when we first started making dyes, I went with a number as far as the uh the case protrusion out of the die that I thought made sense. So if your shell holder it is typically 125 thousandths from the bolt face to the top of the shell holder on most, you know, standard shell holders. So I thought, okay, if I had, let's say 130 or 132 thousandths of cartridge protrusion out of the die, that would give us, you know, five to seven thousandths of sizing. It just doesn't work that way. There's spring back, there's all kinds of other stuff. So when we first started making dies, we were actually having people say, hey, look, I can't bump my shoulder back. I'm jamming the shell holder um, into the, the bottom of the die or whatever. It's just not bumping the shoulder. And that's the last thing I wanted people to have to do is like modify or machine any of our dies because that's one of the issues I was trying to solve. So we actually increased the amount of cartridge protrusion more than what I thought we would need because there's just so much nuance that goes into sizing. For example, if you took a 243 with Lapua brass and a six Creedmoor with Lapua brass, just because of the geometry of the cases, you know, the 20 degree versus the 30 degree shoulder, the 455 or whatever the uh, 243 shoulder is versus the 463 of the Creedmoor, the 243 is going to size easier and faster than the Creedmoor is. So for example, let's say you're using a competition show holder and we'll just use Reddings for example, you know, if you're using the, I don't know, plus two or whatever to size the Creedmoor, you could probably bump the shoulder back the same amount with a deeper shell holder, like a plus four or plus six, just because just the geometry of the case lends itself to sizing, you know, diametrically and all the angles and all that. So there is so much nuance that I didn't want to have to create a 243 die that had 135 thousandths of protrusion and then a six creed more than 140 or whatever. So with that being said, if you try to touch the shell holder to the bottom of the die, there's a good chance that you can size more than you want to. And some people were starting to complain about that. So at first we we're on one end of the spectrum where we weren't sizing enough. And then people are saying we're sizing too much. Well, then my question is, why does the, the die need to touch a shell holder? And that's one thing that I looked into. And what I found was people think that they're getting their die to touch the shell holder, but they're not. So I'm just going to use a Forrester Coax and a, um, I don't know, a Redding T7 or a RCBS Rock Chucker. Screw, you know, run your RAM all the way up. Then you screw your die down until it touches. And then you back the RAM down, you screw your die hair more, you're working the handle. You're like, man, I'm just getting this awesome cam over feel where I can just feel the linkage lock up and whatever. I promise you, the moment you put a piece of brass in your die, you are no longer getting any shell holder contact with your die because the amount of pressure required to size your brass is greater than that, that initial pressure that you're getting when you set your die up. So people think that they are getting this metal metal contact with their die and their shell holder when they're sizing. But I guarantee if they were to take a flashlight or a feeler gauge or something and measure, they're no longer even touching the two together. So people think you need to have this metal to metal contact when in reality, they're not even contacting anyway and they're getting the results they want. So I just would tell people, if you're sizing too much, back your die off a little bit. Oh, well, I want to get contact. Well, you're not even contacting it. So it's this whole big thing where, A, I don't even like arguing with people. I, I genuinely like helping and educating people, but some people just don't, you know, they got their mind made up and it's it's yeah. wrong or whatever. So as a manufacturer of dyes, that was a conflict with the way we make our dyes because I want it to work in everybody's press, everybody's, you know, setup, period. And the only way to do that is to make sure there's enough cartridge protrusion out of the die to where no matter what you can size. The other thing is, um, what are the chances, let's say we just take a RCBS rock chucker and you've got this big C frame or whatever, there's a support in the front, you've got your back frame. 
what are the chances that the ram is being perfectly guided straight up concentrically with the top threads you know what are the chances that the top threads which are thread a threaded insert inside of bigger threads are going to bring the die square and concentric and whatever i mean even some of the real you know the higher end ones that are above a thousand dollars like you would think that it'd be better but there it's still not gonna be perfect so i wanted to design features in our press that it's meant to be at zero or you know no concentricity issues or axial or angular runout but if there are for whatever reason the press would completely compensate and take care of that so we had a couple big ticket items which was getting people to size brass without worrying about the shell holder and the die like that is just something i want to completely eliminate don't worry about it if you're sizing too much back your dial if you're not sizing enough screw your die down we wanted to eliminate any type of you know angler or, or concentricity run out and we wanted it to be a quick change so we we've always been a big fan of the forester coax it's a great press i like how the die kind of floats radially in there so i wanted to kind of do something similar to that um but where ours is really different is, A, we've designed it to where the shell holder sits. There's convex and concave geometry between the bottom of the shell holder and the little uh, disc or dish that it sits in. That way, it can square itself up and always be nice and square with, your, um, with the die. So we've taken care of that. The die is allowed to float radially in the press. So if you know, and it's not a lot, but it's enough to where if it needs to move around it, we're not binding it down. We're not threading it into a, a, a hole, locking down a lock ring and just jamming things together, hoping that everything is square and concentric. We're letting it have room to do that. And I think the longer people are around and when I first started building rifles, you know, I thought, oh, let's have five thousandths of clearance in front of the bolt nose and five thousandths around the bolt nose. And, you know, but you're not giving anything any room. If you get a cleaning you know, bristle that gets in there, or dirt or a piece of uh, a, a powder kernel that somehow gets in there, you know, like you're going to lock everything up. So with actions, with, with everything, I just think things need room to breathe and kind of like um, sort itself out. So I wanted to kind of use that philosophy on a press. So we designed our shell holder to work that way. We designed the, the, the die to be able to float radially. It's quick change. It's um, with the Forrester coax, it uses one like ball bearing that's spring loaded down and that interfaces with your shell holder, or I'm sorry, with the die lock ring. I didn't want that. Ours is designed to where there's two ball bearings like spring uh, plunger style that interface with the die body has nothing to do with the shell holder or with the lock ring. So when you put the die in, it's allowing the die body to float. It has nothing to do with the lock ring. It doesn't, you don't need a special lock ring. You can run uh, RCBS, uh, Hornady, anybody's lock ring with our press, it's not going to matter. So I wanted to make our press as universal as possible to where you don't have to run our dies. You don't have to do anything. Our press will work well with anybody's setup. Plus it's able to handle, you know, up to a one inch die. We are going to make inch 250 uh, die block for it, but it's not a huge priority right now because there's not a whole lot of dies out there that are, are that size. So once we get everything kind of settled in and get production up to speed, we'll address that. But um, I also kind of liked the way the handle works, you know, by pulling it down. Uh, we've got a really large, generous work area to work out of, um, you know, like with the rock chucker and, and other presses. You just don't have a lot of room to put the brass in and out. With ours, it's it's 100% ambidextrous. You can use your left or right hand. Um, there's just so much room to operate out of. And more importantly, when we've got the shell holder in the base and we've got our floating die block, you're bringing the die down to the shell holder. When you do that, you're compressing the system together kind of like a vice grip. All the other presses out there besides the coax, you're pushing this ram up into your die and you're by default, you're just, you're bulging the system. And that's why you know, the rock chucker and a lot of these other presses have to have supports in the front of them. And that's why the turret presses, the top turret will flex up is because you're pushing this ram with hundreds of foot pounds, you know, pounds of uh, energy upwards, you're going to flex it. But with our setup, you're bringing them down and everything is inherently uh, more stress-free. So like the top of our press, when everything's locked down, 
it's not under any pressure. It's not under stress. You can, you can typically take the two linear rods that we have and they'll spin because they're not being torqued or they're not under any pressure. So I think it's just inherently a better way of sizing brass versus having your die stationary and then running a ram up. You're just trying, there's a tremendous amount of pressure and you're splitting and you're bulging, you're creating all this stress when you try to size where with ours, you've got a, a one inch steel base and you bring an inch and a half steel block down and they just get cammed over like a, a vice grip. And those two get locked together. The base isn't under, you know, it's not being twisted, contorted or bulged or moved. You've got these large flat surfaces that have shouldered up. And that's another reason why our press is a lot different is when I first started designing them, I mean, I've probably got hundreds of hours on SolidWorks just trying through things. I, I made a conventional RAM style press and then I, I went with our whatever, you know, what ended up being the Nexus press. And I started building them equally and putting equal amounts of effort into both designs until I realized when you have a RAM that goes up, I can't build the features that I want. I can't build a floating shell holder that can take up any type of angular runout. I can't build a solid metal to metal contact system that eliminates the shell holder and the die in that type of system. I have to have all these supports and it's just getting bigger and bulkier and more out of control to where it's like, it's just not a great design for any type of real advancement. So that's when we transitioned from a more conventional RAM style press to, um, what ultimately became the Nexus press is we could fit everything we wanted to. So the other big feature that no other press has is we've got two large, uh, they're about one inch in diameter. Uh, we call them the cam over blocks that sit down. So when the floating die block comes down, it contacts squares up and shoulders up with these two uh, cam over blocks. And what that does is that takes all the play out of the system, it completely locks everything up to where the, the press has a metal to metal contact, everything is shouldered up. When the linkage is fully cammed over, but it completely eliminates the shell holder from touching the die. And when you don't have a piece of brass in there, you can pull your die in and out. It's not under any stress. So when you're sizing, the only thing touching your die is the lock ring and then the brass going in. You're not trying to jam something on the bottom of it. You're not putting any type of pressure on it. And that was just always silly to me that people take this, you know, hardened shell holder and they try to just absolutely crush and ram it into the bottom of your, uh, your die. And when you have a press that doesn't have any cam over, you need some type of mechanical stop to limit the, the sizing because otherwise you get really inconsistent sizing. But when you have a cam over system, you're taking advantage of all the consistency in power and um, travel that a linkage camming over offers. If you think about a piston in an engine, you know, a crankshaft, the piston can't go any higher or generate any more pressure than when it's at top dead center. It can't magically jump up higher or lower. So when a linkage cams over, it's hitting the same travel, the same pressure every single cycle. And then when we add our, so you don't even need to use our cam over blocks. That's just an extra warm and fuzzy to let people have, you know, the people that want to touch their die to their show holder, okay, use our cam over blocks. That'll allow you to get that hard metal metal contact every cycle if you want, but you don't need it because you look at just about every single press on the market and the linkage cams over because it's a proven system that works every time. So we wanted to make sure that we had at least, you know, right around two degrees of cam over, you know, past top dead center to where when you run the handle down, you feel that initial pressure spike. And then when it cams over, it drops just a little bit. That's also so when you're at full lockup, you're not at maximum pressure. You know, it, it peaks and then it drops a little bit. So there's just a lot of really small things that we wanted to add and create in this press that these weren't bolt on updates to other presses out there because it would have been a lot easier just to make a, a little conversion kit or a, you know, something that we could just throw on and probably more profitable because there's a gazillion rock chuckers out there. There's a gazillion <laughs> Reading big bosses and T sevens and, you know, whatever and coaxes, but 
you just can't add these types of things to those. Um, so there's just a lot of things that we wanted to do. And I feel like I'm really happy with how everything's worked out and it's just been a great product. It's just a pain in the butt. We're using pre-hardened 4140. It's hard on tooling. It's just, it's been a process, you know, getting up to speed. And plus, you know, since we just started and really in 2018 making stuff, you know, we've had to learn a lot about manufacturing as far as, you know, tool life management and I'm the type of guy, like two years ago, I would just run a tool until it's sparking or whatever, you know, if it's a rougher, but you can't do that now, you know, you have to have redundant tools set up. So, you know, we're spending a lot of time and energy working with our, you know, vendors and our companies, you know, machine uh, builders on how to properly run these things and how the pallet systems work. We're trying to, you know, so there's just a lot of stuff going on every day here at the shop and I'm, you know, we're trying to train up people and whatnot, but it's, uh, I'm really excited about the, the Nexus press that we're, you know, we're on track to, to deliver them soon. Uh, we basically had to buy a second batch of, of, uh, material to boost up the original numbers that we're going to make. So I think we we're just going to make 200 to start. And then, you know, we debuted at shot show. And I think the first day we sold like 225 or something. So it's like, crap, now we got to order more materials. So the first, the first batch is all done. We're, we're assembling them, but.